The wearing of face masks in public places is mandatory in Cameroon. The interministerial meeting evaluates the COVID-19 response strategy and examines the role of local authorities in ensuring the respect of the order. Transmission equipment for the supply of power from the Menvelo Hydroelectric Dam is being installed along the Nyabisan Yamunde stretch. Work on the transmission line is assessed by the Water and Energy Boards. The National Anti-Corruption Commission stops the siphoning of over 1,600 billion CFA francs in seven years. The figures are unveiled as preparations for the African Anti-Corruption Day heighten. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Those were the headlines of the 730 News. The wearing of face masks in public places will be mandatory until further notice. You welcome back. We begin with news from the Unity Palace. The Chief Executive Officer of the multinational agro-industrial giant, Jill Cotton, says his company will expand its business stake in Cameroon. Abbas Jebel was speaking today at an audience granted him by the Minister of State, Secretary General of the Presidency of the Republic, Ferdinand Gongo, on behalf of President Paul Bia. Senior State Correspondent Ashunyenti reports on the audience at the Unity Palace. Cameroon remains an attractive business destination. This is the meaning that can be read from this visit. The chief executive officer of the multinational agro-industrial concern, Gio Cotton, is paying to Cameroon. Abbas Jebe is received this Friday, July 10, 2020, by the Minister of State, Secretary General of the Presidency, Ferdinand Ngongo, on behalf of President Paul Bia and it doesn't hide his satisfaction and happiness for this mark of honor. For about half an hour, Abbas Jebel discusses with the Minister of State the desire to expand their business niche in Cameroon in the areas of cotton and livestock development with a special point of impact in the Adamawa region of Cameroon. He also makes it known that he shares President Paul Bia's development vision and would like his company that is already fully implanted in 12 other African countries to have a stake in this vision. The multinational Jio Cotton is at now shareholder in Sode Cotton, Cameroon's cotton producing outfit. The chief executive officer also talks about his advocacy for debt relief to African countries, which for him is negligible compared with the financial burden of the coronavirus on African countries. Cameroon, in his view, should be a major because of its geostrategic importance. Cameroon. Cameroon is of major interest to Geo Cotton. Du groupe Advance Geo Cotton. And even France and the European Union. Because Cameroon has a strategic location in Africa, neighbor to some of the large countries with a fast growing population. All these people will need to be fed in the years to come. Cameroon is a breadbasket of Central Africa. We are convinced about that. It is therefore clear that many other business interests will seek to make Cameroon a hub. The chief executive officer of the Avens Joe Cotton Group was also received at the Star Building by Prime Minister Joseph John Guti and Abbas Jaber exchanged on the business climate in Cameroon as well as the opportunities to open foreign investors in the country. The audience was also an opportunity for the CEO of the group to present his company and the business engagements in Cameroon. The head of government reassured the investor of Cameroon's openness to foreign investors and voiced the government's willingness to accompany them in their ventures. Meantime, on to one of our top stories. The wearing of face masks remains obligatory in public places in Cameroon. This was reiterated by Prime Minister Joseph Jengute today during an interministerial meeting to evaluate the government response strategy against COVID-19. Today's virtual session also examined the role of youth volunteers in awareness building against the contagious virus as well as the role of financial partners. Christian Chiatam has the details. 
COVID-19 is real. COVID-19 is active in Cameroon, and the wearing of face masks is mandatory. Those are the opening remarks of the Prime Minister during this Friday's interministerial meeting. Joseph Djanguti condemned the growing skepticism which is pushing many to abandon their face masks in violation of the decision, making the wearing of masks a must in public places in Cameroon. The effectiveness of mayors and municipal councillors in enforcing the wearing of masks in their different areas was therefore one of the main points under focus. The Minister of Decentralization and Local Development, Georges Elangaubam, said his department is mobilizing the municipal leadership across Cameroon to be more proactive in implementing the decision throughout the country. The interministerial meeting also dwelled on the participation of youth volunteers in Cameroon's anti-COVID-19 campaign. The Minister of Youth Affairs and Civic Education, Muluna Futsu, revealed during the session that 26,374 youths from different movements and organizations have been carrying out proximity community education and information campaigns to make the work of health workers easier. The Minister of the Economy, Alamin Usman May, for his part, presented an update of contributions of Cameroon's international partners to the country's drive against COVID-19. The latest statistics which emerged from the meeting indicate 15,173 positive cases of COVID-19 recorded in Cameroon so far, with 11,928 already declared healed and 359 deaths recorded. It was also revealed that close to 121,000 COVID-19 tests have been carried out in Cameroon so far. At the end of the session, the Prime Minister instructed the Minister of Decentralization and Local Development to mobilize council officials towards a more active role in enforcing the wearing of face masks in public places across Cameroon. Joseph John Gute equally called for the strict follow-up and protection of youths engaged in the anti-COVID campaign. In other news, transmission equipments for the supply of adequate quantity and quality of electricity from the Memvilla Hydroelectric Dam is being installed along the Nyabisen Yaoundé stretch. The Minister of Water Resources and Energy, Gaston Elundwe Somba, today paid a working visit to one of the distribution posts at a Kombiti village in Bamayu to take stock of the progress of work on the transmission line. Ewane Epole trailed the minister in our reports. The electricity supply project of the Menvelo Hydroelectric Power Plant, set to be fully operational by the end of this year, is expected to provide sufficient energy to resolve the electricity deficit in the country. The Minister of Water Resources and Energy this Friday paid a working visit to the distribution post of a Combitia village in Balmayo subdivision to take stock of the progress of work along the transmission line from Nyabizan to Yaoundé. Transmission line production by 30 megawatts, able to stabilize the entire connect network. The Director General of Sonatrail, Victor Mbemi Nyanga, and the manager of the Menvele Hydroelectric Dam, Theodore Nsangu, guided the minister as he visited the transmission equipment. Meanwhile, the locals of Ekombetia village expressed gratitude to government. Say thank you because we have been witnessing electricity cut all the time. In the past, the electricity was not as powerful as such. According to the Minister of Water Resources and Energy, the Menvele Hydroelectric Project stems from the desire of the Cameroon government to optimize the use of their energy resources by integrating their power generation, transmission and distribution. These will ensure the supply of adequate quantity and quality of electricity at low cost, thus contributing to improving the living conditions of the population. The project to link up power transportation lines from Mvelo to the substation in Bamayo aims at enabling the hydropower plant to contribute more to the South Interconnection Network. The works overseen by the National Electricity Transportation Corporation, so natural, lasted seven weeks and is expected to put out of use the costly thermal plants. Clarice Aritakang reports. 
securing the electricity transportation network from the Menvele hydropower plant and pushing the available energy level up from 60 to 80 megawatts in order to reduce the thermal pressure on the electricity grid. These are the stakes of the project to link up the 225 kilovolt Ebolowang called Kumu and 90 kilovolt Mbalmayo power lines initially at Minlami Zibi. The exercise with the National Electricity Transportation Corporation, so natural, overseeing the works, was equally aimed at supplying the South Interconnection Network with an additional 60 megawatts of hydro energy through the 90 kilovolt Ahala Mbalmayon line. We were expecting 80 megawatts of electricity but ended up with 90 megawatts and this could go further. It is very important for us. 30 megawatts is about two or three thermal plants which will be shut down. This will enable the state to save some money but also the energy sector because thermal plants are costly to manage. The major challenge was to readapt the design to the equipment without interrupting supply but also avoid the destruction of property. By the time the works were rounding up, 90 megawatts of electricity was transported from the 211 megawatt capacity Menvele plant to the network, 30 megawatts more than the 60 prior to the project. Engineers of the National Electricity Transportation Corporation have been able to ensure that the newly constructed lines did not give way under the additional power. There was technical expertise required because we had to link the lines up to make them look like one. This made a higher transportation of energy possible. So Natural constructed the lines through 700 meters to go from the Menvele plant to Mbalmayu. With the collaboration of energy stakeholders, under the supervision of the Minister of Water and Energy, homes and businesses in Yaoundé are henceforth enjoying 30 megawatts more of power. The telecommunication sector in Cameroon can now boast of an additional debt to secure the country's information. This is made possible through the Cameroon Telecommunications Camtel that now has an ultra-modern data center in Zamangwe in the center region. The Minister of Post and Telecommunications, Minet Libom Li Likeng, was on the site for an appraisal as we hear this report by Yoti Kaleli Songe. From a digital transformation vision to a reality, Cameroon Telecommunications can now boast of an ultra-modern data center at Zamangwe, Lekia Division of the Center Region. The server room alone is 400 meters square. This data center is very strong and now we, are, we feel free to encourage all operators that they can come and develop contents in Cameroon and they can surely keep them in that data center. The problem of data collection, storage, distribution and access has also been thrashed with through this facility that has 7,000 terabyte storage arrays. Security, confidentiality and low cost of uh, uh, the data centers, this is the main advantage we have with this infrastructure. If you keep your data abroad, you are going to lose your sovereignty. And today, I'm very proud to see that our historical operator has a very strong and performant data center. And to further ensure security, a fire detection system has been installed as well as video surveillance. With three 800 kilovolts ampere transformers, Camtel services to users officials say will be nothing short of the best, marking a new dawn for Cameroon's telecommunications sector. As announced in one of our top stories, the National Anti-Corruption Commission, CONAC, says within seven years it has halted the embezzlement of the sum of 1,653 billion CFA francs from state coffers. The chairman of the commission, Reverend Judoni Masigams, made the revelation today during a press conference in Yaoundé in prelude to the African Anti-Corruption Day observed every July 11. Muki Edwin Kinzika tells us more. According to Reverend Masigams, it's been a decade of a fruitful but merciless fight against graft. From 2011 to 2017, over 1,652 billion, 582 million francs, an equivalent of over a quarter of the 2020 state budget, was either recovered, is still under recovery, or has been prevented from being siphoned from the Cameroon people's coffers through fraudulent transfers of salaries and pensions 
false tax declarations and other forms of looting. What is interesting also is that uh, many ministries are interested to the fight against corruption because they have created in the ministry uh, many cells of uh, fights against corruption. Cameroon's enforcement of certain international conventions contributed to the success. According to the, the will, the will of the head of state, because he decided also to ratify uh, the African Convention of the Fights Against Corruption. And today, the Cameroon is very well engaged on the fight against corruption. Cameroon and Africa intend to consolidate their achievements as they celebrate Africa Anti-Corruption Day this Saturday under the theme Fighting Corruption Through Effective and Efficient Judicial Systems. In other news, the National Advisory Board has validated five collective conventions during its 22nd session in Yaoundé, presided over by Labor and Social Security Minister Gregoire Owona. The members validated the collective conventions on the cargo handling activities, banking industry, security guard companies and those of the logging sector. It was attended by the Minister of Employment and Vocational Training, Isa Chirumabakari. Constantine Bom tells us more. This 22nd session of the National Advisory Board has reviewed and validated national collective conventions of the workers in the cargo handling sector, the baking industries, security guard companies, the logging sector, waste management and sanitation, and the telecommunications sector. The collective conventions come to better organize the world of work and protect workers. The duration of the framework contract, the rights and obligations of the employer and employees, and items of remuneration are well defined. I mean many texts to ameliorate uh, the environment of workers and employment. Employment contracts are hard to get in the sectors. This session will see worker status well protected as per the social security legislation. Certain dispositions that were not taken into account concerning temporary workers, firstly in terms of certain terms that are used uh, for temporary workers, is going to change. There are a lot of changes that have been made. Also in terms of you know delivering attestations for international workers coming to do certain jobs in Cameroon, that also was one thing that was being tabled for us to really try to protect you know the Cameroonian laborers, ensuring that before attestations are given for us to have expatriates in certain fields, we have to ensure that we have Cameroonians who can do the job. The Minister of Employment and Vocational Training, Isa Choruma Bakari, was part of the session as his ministry has a great role to play in protecting the world of work as well. We should bear in mind that negligence by a single individual can seriously harm the entire community. And now on to COVID-19 news. The non-wearing of face masks in all public places recommended by the states for over two months now will now be considered an offense for the population. Local authorities have been charged to ensure that the order is respected to the letter in order to reduce the number of infections that stand at over 15,000 in the country. Tonight, Gilbert Ongene in the Public Health Emergency Operations Center talks to us about some of the laboratory diagnostic strategies of COVID-19 with his guest, Professor Judith to Remiro. Hello, Gilbert. Hello. Hello, Esther Kima. Welcome to the Public Health Emergency Operations Center. Uh, tonight, we, of course, uh, had a brief, uh, press briefing a while ago with uh, Dr. Alain George Tundimbala, who, of course, uh, hinted that Cameroon is fast becoming a model insofar as uh, mitigating the social and economic impact of the coronavirus is uh, concerned. I also touched on uh, the three T, that's the uh, test, uh, treat, and track, test, track, and treat, uh, three T uh, strategy that's been adopted by the government, which is working very, very efficiently uh, on the ground. And uh, the national surveillance method that we put on the ground too, has uh, been extended uh, 
to all institutions, beginning with uh, primary, uh, secondary, and universities, and of course, prisons, institutions, and of course, in uh, uh, public uh, offices where people are being tracked. And you would talk to about uh, those who are, who are being tested uh, for the COVID-19. Uh, we're talking here of uh, travelers, uh, vulnerable people, like uh, people who are aged, who, those who have, uh, of course, cancer, HIV, AIDS, and other uh, chronic diseases. And uh, those are some of the issues that uh, we had uh, during the press uh, briefing of tonight. And we have our guest uh, today, uh, Professor Judith Torimiro, who is a member of the Scientific Council of Emergencies in Public Health. Good evening, Dr. Uh, Professor, welcome to CRTV. Uh, we remind our uh, televiewers that you are also Africa Task Force for the Nobel Coronavirus based at Africa CDC, that's in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. We're talking tonight of a laboratory-based diagnostic uh, strategies for COVID-19. Uh, now, uh, Prof, tell us, what are the testing mechanisms put in place for the screening of COVID-19 in Cameroon? Yes, uh, the choice for a diagnostic strategy for COVID-19 depends on several factors, including um, the cost and availability of tests. By test, in this case, we mean um, a procedure that would detect the virus, which means uh, for COVID-19, that would be the genetic material or a protein, which we commonly call an antigen, or a test that can give us a sense of the response of the individual who is infected, which we call antibodies against that virus. And generally, there are several tests that have been produced that are commercially available, but some have been approved by regulatory bodies and some have not been approved. And therefore, it is important to choose um, tests that have been approved at an international level and get the test rigorously evaluated in our context. Um, there are reasons for testing, of course. And in one category, we think of rapidly identifying and confirming clinically suspected cases of COVID-19 to guide patient management. And secondly, we think of rapid situational analysis um, of an outbreak, for example, in a small community, such that um, we can advise public health measures and control strategies. And thirdly, we can use testing for surveillance to monitor the trend of uh, the disease in the community. However, uh, it is important to note that the Ministry of Public Health has selected um, tests that detect the virus, which um, uh, generally have a higher performance. And, and this test um, uh, could be facility-based, which means you need a well-sophisticated laboratory, or they could be rapid diagnostic tests or point-of-care tests. Um, it is important also to outline here that to strengthen the health system and to bring testing for COVID-19 very close to the population, there are rapid diagnostic antigen tests available at different points in the country. And these strategies become very useful depending on the target and the purpose for testing. Thank you, uh, Prof. Now, uh, listening to you, we have the impression that everything is going on on the ground as smoothly as uh, laid down by the Minister of Public Health and WHO. Is that the case? Are there some problems with testing? We hear that there are some uh, people who carry out tests that are not recognized by the government of Cameroon in the country. In general, it is um, important that the population understands that a diagnostic test should accurately, more or less, pick anyone who is infected with this virus. And a diagnostic test should be able to give a negative result to me that individual does not have the virus. If we miss that and give a false result, either a false positive result or a false negative result, then there could be several challenges, psychological and a waste of resources and the like. 
And it is um, important to note that the tests that have been um, selected by the Ministry of Public Health, which we find in the designated laboratories for COVID-19 diagnosis, are free of charge, and they are tests that pick the virus, which is very important. And making available the rapid diagnostic tests that will pick up a part of the virus, a protein of the virus, makes uh, diagnosis um, uh, to be carried out at a very peripheral level. And therefore, it is very important that the population knows when to get tested, where to go for testing, and what kind of test to use and at the right time and at the right place. Because no matter what uh, the, the case may be, the World Health Organization or Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention do not uh, recommend any test that detects but antibody, which means the response of the individual to this infection as a, a means of um, confirming the current COVID-19. So we want to be careful that the population needs to know about this. Testing is free and in designated laboratories and uh, with good results. Testing is free of charge. That's the take-home message you should you know, today, Cameroonians uh, should be careful, beware of centers where they go and are charged to be tested. Uh, the designated uh, centers for testing are known, and you need to get the right information from officials of the Ministry of Public Health and make sure that when you carry out your test, it's recognized by the government of Cameroon. Well, that's uh, our guest for tonight, Professor Judith. Tori Miro, who is, of course, a member of the Santri Council of Emergencies in Public Health and who is also a member of the Africa Task Force uh, for the novel coronavirus based at Africa CDC in Addis Abeba, Ethiopia. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor. And over to you, uh, Kima Esther. Thanks very much, Gilbert, for providing those details with the different kinds of tests conducted in laboratories to ease the detection of the coronavirus. Now on to security. Two of the seven persons suspected for the gruesome murder of the wardress of the Bamenda Central Prison, Florence Ayafo, last September have been apprehended. They were presented today at the Ministry of Defense before pressmen after an investigation carried out in Douala led to their arrest. Kini Andandifun tells us more. Lost in the close to four years crisis in the northwest and southwest regions is one too many. But the most gruesome was the mother of 46-year-old wardress Florence Ayafo in Mezam Division, northwest region on September 29, 2019. The following day, September 30, 2019, the macabre video of her gruesome killing went viral on social media. The video clearly showed seven men, four of whom were dragging the young woman stacked naked, legs wide apart, with a rope on her neck for several hundred meters after having raped her. Florence Iyafo was later beheaded with a knife and a machete, her head deposited near her body in a pool of blood. Two of the seven killers arrested by the military security division, 30 and 31 years old, have been presented to the press in Yaoundé. Intelligence provided by local sources led to the arrest of Niba Innocent Akuma. Former investigations carried out by detectives of the Division of Military Security paved the way to track down his accomplice, Ngu Roger. At the time of his arrest, Ngu Roger was concluding a clandestine operation in the procurement of arms and ammunition in Douala. The first two culprits arrested to be handed over to the judiciary will help to track down their accomplices. While they are expected to face the arm of the law, 316 lawyers have taken the oath of office at the Court of Appeal of the Centre Region. They've been enjoined to respect professional secrets, which are crucial in the passing of judgments by the Vice President of the Court of Appeal for the Centre Region, Shalik Gilbert. Sidoni Jobmandi has a detail. 
It has been a long journey for these 316 young lawyers who finally graduated after five years of training instead of two years, as provided for by the law. For three days, they all took the oath to respect human rights and priorities of the procedure of the court and tribunals of the Republic. I just intend to continue doing what I've been doing, um, representing clients, um, implementing the law, but the only difference is I'll be doing it with more certification, with more independence. So naturally, I'm looking forward to, to pursuing my career fully now. According to these new lawyers, taking an oath in a court of law is to accept to work in conformity with prescriptions of the judicial system. We have experienced so much during the past years, but the common, the common factor between all of us is our resilience. We have stuck. We did not abandon. Given all the challenges we faced, we stuck to our goal and we finally made it, so yes. While officially presenting men of the legal profession to the public, authorities of the judiciary also urged them to be good examples in the execution of their duty. They have completed the pupillage, but they are standing on their own feet now. A lawyer is not a businessman. He is bound by the oath that he takes. And so he must be comfortable wherever he is, but abiding by the oath he or she took. The sworn-in lawyers at the Court of Appeal of the Central Region were all admitted into the 2020 final bar examination. We now take you to Parliament, where the second ordinary session for the 2020 legislative year at the Senate and at the National Assembly has ended with the adoption of seven bills that strengthen Cameroon's developments. The bills were adopted during different plenary sittings defended by members of government. Charles Anyangui has details of the session. The general appraisal of parliamentarians concerning the just ended June session is that it was a great one. I'm very happy about this session. It was quite interesting. Uh, we have been working a lot. We learned a lot. It has been a highly implicative uh, session, a session that uh, kept all the senators awake during the day and night uh, to scrutinize and examine these uh, bills very well before giving their vote. The session was a session with a difference. We were able to operate within the same environment with the National Assembly, enabling us to um, encounter each other within the corridors and have exchanges and uh, uh, compare notes on issues that emanated on the floor of the Senate. Out of the seven bills that were adopted, the one concerning the amendment of the finance law for 2020 caught the attention of members of the upper and lower houses of parliament. The president had sent a bill uh, readjusting the finance bill. I think it was timely because the situation we are living in Cameroon now warranted that COVID-19 has come with its own challenges. This law was modified, was amended, so we have uh, to work on it more than the others. It was the same scenario with the bill to regulate artistic and cultural associations in Cameroon. It was necessary that we start somewhere to organize uh, artists. A lot of people don't uh, notice that, but it is a major income generating uh, activity. And I think that's what government took in cognizance in elaborating that bill. The other bills, notably that on the freedom of association, the bill to regulate statistical activities, and the other on the conservation of gorillas, as well as that concerning Muslim women, were all adopted to the satisfaction of parliamentarians. The bills adopted were crowned with the budgetary orientation debate and the presentation of the medium-term economic and budgetary program that parliamentarians deemed very important. We talked about the budget orientation so that by the time we come next time, all of that will be put in place. And we had some quite some significant advances with the budgetary orientation bill. And I hope that next year the debate on the budgetary orientation uh, will be even better than what we had this year. Members of the National Assembly during this June session donated the sum of 100 million francs as part of their contributions towards the fight against COVID-19 in the country. 
a book which serves as a guide to parliamentarians as well as council and regional authorities on the specifics of administrative correspondences has been launched at the National Assembly. The book, titled Précis de correspondance administrative à l'adresse des parlementaires, des maires, des chefs de région, is authored by Honorable David Manfo. Meantime, the Parliamentary Network on the Promotion of Good Governance in the Extractive Industries Sector met in its General Assembly. Details in this report. The level of mastery of administrative correspondence is one of the most important tools for achieving organizational goals is quite minimal. In order to provide adequate information and increase the expertise of the staff and managers of organizations, the 355-page book authored by Honorable David Manfo hits the shelves. The guide, prefaced by Professor Alain C. Pangop and published by Edition Clay in four parts, presents specifics on the different types of correspondences, such as letters and circulars, as well as techniques on the accuracy, durability, and legal components of administrative writing. The 10-chapter publication was applauded by Deputy Speaker Honorable Theophile Bauro, who presided over the launch in the presence of members of government and university dons. In uh, this book, parliamentarians, mayor, all, uh, uh, let's say, civil servants uh, can find what they need. There are many laws there, presidential texts there, and it's a complete book. For the author, Le Précis des Correspondances Administratives targets the entire public and serves as a source of knowledge. This work is done to help any person to know what's the way he can take to continue his, uh, his journey. When you have it, you may communicate fine, and you may succeed in your communication. On the sidelines of the book launch, the Parliamentary Network for the Promotion of Good Governance in Extractive Industries worked on its plan of action for 2020. The main objective is to ensure that there is good governance in the extractive sector and to ensure that the community that's had, that have these resources benefits from them. Their intention is to enable local communities benefit fully from local resources and to protect the rights of forest indigenous peoples. In economic news, the sum of 90 billion civil friends has been disbursed to all CEMAC member states to aid in the fight against the deadly coronavirus pandemic. The decision was announced during the board meeting of the Central African States Development Bank under the chairmanship of the Central African Minister of Finance and the Budget, Harry Mari Dondra. Caroline Okeanoma tells us more. March 17, 2020 was a scheduled date for the board meeting of the Central African State Development Bank, best known by its French acronym as BDEAC. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 decided otherwise. Four months later, members of the board meeting today held the meeting via video conferencing with the chairperson Henri Marie Dondra, Minister of Finance and Budget in the Central African Republic, presiding over. After close to eight hours of deliberation, the board meeting approved the disbursement of 155 billion CFE francs to be distributed to all the six CEMAC member countries. Of the 155 billion CFE francs, 90 billion CFE francs is destined to aid each member country in the fight against COVID-19, while the rest of the 65 billion CFE francs will help CEMAC member countries to revamp their individual economy and development projects. This is mostly in the field of health, water, and agro-industry, and transportation. This will help in the creation of new jobs and boost the economy of the sub-region. Other measures undertaken were the adoption of the intervention strategic document, which covers 2017 to 2022, the balance sheet of the bank, the 2019 annual report, appointment, and the general work environment of the bank. It is worth noting that Cameron's Minister of Finance, Louis Paul Motose, is the outgoing chairperson of the bank. Minister Louis Paul Motose was lauded for leaving the bank in a positive state with over 7% growth rate in the overall account and 4% increase in banking products. And now on to the wave of installations of Secretary Generals of Ministries in the Ministry of Sports and Physical Education. Joseph Yurima has been installed and challenged to promote excellence in the sector. Meanwhile, Benga Zashe Robert Theophil, commissioned into the same posts in the Ministry of Youth Affairs and Civic Education, will have to facilitate the insertion of youth in development policies. Baldwin Sama and Joyce Tata 
Tell us more. From education still to education, 50-year-old Zashe Roberto Filbenga, former Secretary General at the Ministry of Sports and Physical Education, is now Secretary General at the Ministry of Youth Affairs and Civic Education. The high intellectual profile Cameroonian takes office at a time when the need of youth to be met is on high demand. Among which we have this terminal program, special program for youth, we are going to work. He takes over from Joseph Yerima, who has served the ministry for four years and has been called to other duties. The new Secretary General, father of two, was employed by Minister Mununa Futsu to put to use his rich parkour in stepping up youth social insertion in the job market for a better Cameroon. He comes to the Ministry of Sports and Physical Education as new Secretary General at the time when the ministry is looking forward to organizing important football competitions and Joseph Yivima will have to play a key role to help the ministry succeed. Installing the 51-year-old civil administrator, Sports and Physical Education Minister Professor Nasis Mwele Kombi called on him to use his experience and foster administrative work in the ministry. Our main function is uh, the coordination of uh, the service. So I must work hard in order to put my collaborators in the way of uh, success. Joseph Yerima is holder of a master's degree in private law and has served as director in different ministries. He is married and a father of six. And we'll stay in sports to talk about the Cameroon Volleyball Federation, which will, from this Saturday, July 11, organize a volleyball competition that will bring together volleyball teams with the aim of detecting future players. The disclosure was made today by the president of the Federation, Serge Abouem. Details with Baldwin Sama. It will be a foretaste of what volleyball players will enjoy with the resumption of sports activities a national volleyball competition to bring together volleyball players of all ages and categories here in Yaoundé. It is a tournament which is organized with a new partner and I can assure you that we have taken all the measures to make sure that during that tournament the spread of COVID is blocked and we have taken all the measures so that this tournament could take place. This volleyball competition would be played behind closed doors with less than 40 persons accepted in the complex of the Advanced School of Public Works. Four matches will be played daily, with a total of 120 matches to be played at the end. The competition will help detect rising stars for the under-17 and under-20 volleyball teams respectively and prepare for the launch of upcoming volleyball competitions as volleyball officials have authorization from the Ministries of Public Health and Sports and Physical Education to organize these tournaments. That will be all for this edition of the 7.30 News. I'll be back tomorrow at 7.30 p.m. Have a lovely night and remember to stay protected because the wearing of face masks in Cameroon is obligatory and local authorities will be watching out for defaulters. Good night. At the end of the PM, you'll be in the company of Atabadi Neoma. Each of us must comply with the measures that have been taken. CRTV News, ici, toute l'info.